With an unprecedented war raging in Eastern Europe and the prospect for nuclear war being higher than it ever has been for our generation, it's imperative that we have a plan to deal with this horrifying worst case scenario. Although we would hope that the possibility of this remains low, we must be ready to deal with the literal fallout of a nuclear war. In this video, Dr. Joe Alton has returned to provide instruction on what to do if the bombs drop, how to minimize radiation exposure, and how to manage radiation sickness. Links for the Survival Medicine Handbook as well as personal protective equipment will be in the description below. So let's get to it. Okay, let's discuss the medical effects of radiation exposure. These are collectively known as radiation sickness or acute radiation syndrome. A certain amount of radiation exposure is tolerable over time, but your goal as medic is to shelter your group so they receive as small a dose as possible. To accomplish this goal, we should first describe the different terms for measuring the quantity of radiation. Scientists use a variety of confusing terms such as RADs, REMS, Sieverts, Becquerels, Grays, and Curies to describe radiation amounts. Different terms describe the amount of radiation being given off by a source, the total amount of radiation that's actually absorbed by a human or an animal, or the chance that a living thing will suffer ill effects from being exposed. Becquerels and Curies, they describe the amount of radiation that, say, a hunk of plutonium gives off into the environment. They're named after the scientists who were the first to work with and die from radioactivity. RADS represents the amount of the radiation in the environment that's actually absorbed by a living thing. Some use the term gray similarly. 100 RADS equals 1 gray. REMS and Sieverts, they're the measurement of the risks of health damage from the radiation absorbed. For our purposes, let's use RADS. RADS stands for Radiation Absorbed Dose, and as I mentioned a second ago, measures the amount of radiation energy transferred to some mass of material, typically humans. An acute radiation dose is one received over a short period of time. It's the most damaging type of exposure. For comparison purposes, we're going to assume that the average person absorbs about 0.6 RADS per year from natural or household sources. You might not have symptoms until you hit 30 to 70 rads of exposure. At that point, you might notice a mild headache or nausea within several hours, but recovery is usually rapid. At 70 to 150 rads, nausea and vomiting is seen in about a third of patients. Decreased wound healing and increased susceptibility to infection in occurs, but eventual recovery is the usual outcome. At 150 to 300 rads, moderate nausea and vomiting happens in a majority of patients. Fatigue and weakness is experienced by about half. Infection and or bleeding may occur due to a weakened immune system. Burns may be seen and medical care will be required by many. Expect occasional deaths at the high end, 300 rads of exposure. At 300 to 500 rads, expect moderate nausea and vomiting, fatigue and weakness in just about all victims. Diarrheal stools, dehydration, loss of appetite, skin breakdown, infection, they will be common. Hair loss is also visible in most over time. At the high end of exposure, expect at least a 50% death rate. At over 500 rads, well, it's not good. Spontaneous bleeding, fever, stomach and intestinal ulcers, bloody diarrhea, dehydration, low blood pressure, infections, hair loss, all this stuff is anticipated in almost all patients and death rates begin to approach 100%. All the effects related to exposure may not happen at the same time or are immediate in many cases. Hair loss, for example, may take 10 to 14 days to appear. Death often occurs weeks after exposure. Be aware that if you're knocked off the grid and modern medical care is not an option, worse outcomes than what I've mentioned are going to be the norm. The treatment goals for radiation sickness are to prevent further radioactive contamination, treat life-threatening injuries like burns and trauma, reduce symptoms, and manage pain. First is decontamination. Decontamination lowers the risk of internal contamination from inhalation, ingestion, or open wounds. This involves removing radioactive particles. Removing clothing and shoes eliminates about 90% of external contamination. Gentle washing with soap and water removes additional radiation particles from the skin. If you have group members with radiation sickness, you're going to have to treat the effects. Things like headache, fever, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, dehydration, burns, sores or ulcers, bacterial infections, and of course pain. 
Medications include pain meds, antibiotics, anti-diarrheals, anti-nausea agents, burn gels and dressings. All these are important to have. Materials to provide daily wound care, they're also important. And also potassium iodide. Potassium iodide, available commercially as ThyroSafe and other brands, is also used. This is a non-radioactive form of iodine. Iodine is essential for proper thyroid function. If you're exposed to a significant radiation, however, your thyroid will absorb radioactive iodine, radioiodine, just as it would other forms of iodine. That would lead to certain cancers down the road. If you take potassium iodide, it prevents the absorption of radioactive iodine. Potassium iodide is most effective when taken as soon as you're aware there's been an exposure. Treat the children first because they're most likely to end up with cancer later on. Treatment for older kids is ThyroSafe 65 milligrams a day for up to 10 days, although if radiation levels are no longer an issue, you can stop the treatment. Adults take 130 milligrams a day for up to 10 days. Alternative methods and dosing for small children and pets, we discuss that further in our Survival Medicine Handbook. Let's talk about prevention. The medic's goal is to prevent exposures over 100 rads. A radiation dosimeter is a useful item to gauge radiation absorbed. It's much more useful than a Geiger counter, in my opinion, and it's widely available commercially. This item helps predict the likelihood of developing radiation sickness. Now, there are three basic ways of decreasing the total amount of radiation exposure. First, limit time spent out in the open. Radiation damage is dependent on the length of exposure. Leave areas where high levels are detected and no adequate shelter is at hand. The activity of radioactive particles decreases over time. After 24 hours, levels usually drop to about a tenth of their previous value or even less. Second, increase the distance from the radioactive source. Radiation disperses over distance and the effects will be decreased in proportion. In nuclear reactor meltdowns, common evacuation patterns include a complete 10-mile circle or sometimes a keyhole consisting of a several-mile circle and an additional three miles radiating from the direction of the prevailing winds. The third way to shield people is to decrease radiation where they are. In many cases, people are going to have to shelter in place. Shielding will decrease exposure exponentially. So it's important to know how to construct a barrier between your people and the radioactive source. Denser materials will give better protection. Shielding effectiveness is measured in terms of having thickness. This is the thickness of a particular material that will reduce gamma radiation, the most dangerous kind, by one half. When you multiply the having thickness, you multiply your protection. Here are the halving thicknesses of some common materials. Lead, 0.4 inches or 1 centimeter. Steel, 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters. Concrete, 2.4 inches or 6 centimeters. Pack soil, 3.6 inches or 9 centimeters. Water, 7.2 inches or 18 centimeters. And wood, 11 inches or 28 centimeters. Now what does this mean from a practical standpoint? Let's take concrete as an example. The halving thickness of concrete is 2.4 inches or 6 centimeters. That barrier thickness of concrete will drop exposure to gamma radiation by half. Doubling the thickness of the barrier to 4.8 inches or 12 centimeters drops it to one fourth, one half times one half. Tripling it to 7.2 inches or 18 centimeters will drop it to one eighth, one half times one half times one half, etc. 10 halving thicknesses drops the total radiation exposure to 1 1,024th of the level in the outside environment. For concrete, that would be 24 inches or 60 centimeters. If you can do that, people not killed by heat or kinetic energy close to ground zero can wait out the highest radiation levels. For lead, the thickness of your lead bunker would only have to be 10 centimeters or 4 inches thick. If it was made of wood, however, you need a barrier 110 inches thick or 2.8 meters. Right now, the risk of a nuclear confrontation from some rogue power isn't zero, but it's small. Let's hope it stays that way. This is Joe Alden, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health and good times or bad. Thanks for watching. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code prepping gear for 10% off. Don't forget the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.